Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to get started. Um, I really uh, appreciate all of you attending our webinar this morning. Our, our, attendance, our attendance has been uh, pretty um, exciting, very overwhelming. Um, welcome to the ANSI Z358.1, uh, What You Need to Know About Emergency Shower and Eyewash Compliance webinar. Um, and again, we really greatly appreciate you uh, taking time out of your morning to be here. Um, before we get started, I wanted to remind everybody really quickly that uh, on uh, to post questions at any time during the presentation using the question section on the control panel. Um, uh, I'll be getting to all of these uh, towards the end of the webinar. We'll hold a live q and I'll start answering those questions. Anything that can't be addressed during the, the live Q&A section at the end of the webinar um, will be uh, addressed post-webinar. Okay, so give me just a second here. Uh, we're just going to share the presentation with everybody. Give me just a moment. Okay, so uh, make sure you use that uh, um, that question section on the control panel. Um, any question that comes to mind, make sure that you ask it. Uh, I'd hate for you to forget um, because all of these will be answered. We'll send it out in, uh, uh, in an email after the presentation to make sure that they're all answered and uh, we don't leave you hanging. So uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. It's going to be available on demand. Uh, and it's going to also be sent to you in a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours after the presentation. Um, poll questions will be launched throughout the presentation. Uh, there's only five. Uh, we're not going to bug you the whole time, uh, but your participation is really appreciated. It helps us to improve our product, um, our content, and make sure that uh, future webinars are what you're expecting. Um, I'm also going to bribe you with a $5 Starbucks gift card. Um, we'll send up a follow-up uh, survey uh, after the webinar um, for some feedback on the webinar to get your thoughts on it and, uh, again, to help improve. Um, and just for doing so, you'll get a $5 Starbucks gift card. So thank you uh, in advance. My name is Justin Dunn. I am the sales product specialist and trainer for uh, the Haas Corporation. Uh, with me is Nicole Dennison. She is our marketing manager. Uh, Nicole, if you want to say hi. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining today. As Justin mentioned, I am going to be the moderator for today's webinar. If you have any questions, if you're having any technical difficulties, please reach out in the chat and I will try to reach um, any question that comes through and we will have a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. If your question does not get answered, as Justin mentioned, we will be following up um, this webinar with uh, questions and answers of everything that was submitted. So hang tight and we will uh, get everything addressed as quickly as possible. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, our topics today are going to include uh, what is the standard? We'll go over the Z358.1 standard, um, the significant requirements of the standard. I'm also going to go over how to test for those requirements in your facilities. Um, we're going to cover ADA for emergency equipment, uh, typically a topic I get uh, approached about, but not something we've included in a webinar before, so I'll cover that in detail later. Uh, best practices for emergency equipment, and then, of course, our, our live Q&A there at the end of the webinar. Um, so real quick, uh, if you've never attended one of my webinars before, uh, I really quickly want to touch on OSHA um, and who OSHA is, if, if you're not familiar. Uh, most of you probably are, um, but they are the agency responsible for regulating emergency shower and eye wash facilities. Um, to some, they're the, the boogeyman, uh, but to most of us, they are uh, the reason why a lot of us go home in one piece. Um, OSHA's standard, however, uh, 29 CFR 1910.151C, uh, covering first aid equipment uh, gives us only a paragraph of information explaining emergency equipment. That paragraph is where the eyes or body of any person may be exposed to injurious corrosive materials. Suitable facilities for quick drenching or flushing of the eyes and body shall be provided within the work area for immediate emergency use. Now this isn't a lot of information to go on. It tells us that we need equipment 
tells us why. It doesn't give us the how do we accomplish that portion um, that is vitally important, which is why we have ANSI, and, and that's how that comes into play. Um, our reason uh, for being here today, hopefully everybody's reason for uh, being here today, is prevention, uh, reducing injuries and fatalities uh, in your workplaces, lowering general workplace risk, and then helping to reduce the amount of lost time and money for both you, your employees, uh, any potential litigation, et cetera, and making a, a safer environment. Now, OSHA has uh, stepped up enforcement, particularly for employers uh, who have a history of serious or repeated violations. And that's not just for emergency equipment, that's across the board, that's fall protection, that's a, a lot of different categories. Now, on August 1st, 2016, OSHA fines increased for the first time since 1990 by 80%. Uh, they were not increasing their fines due to inflation and to adjust for, the, uh, for our market. So 26 years passed before they had an increase. So uh, effective January 2nd, 2018, OSHA fines have increased by an additional 2% to account for inflation. And this is gonna happen year over year, they're gonna be readjusting. So uh, compliance is more important than, than ever. Uh, this map is, uh, this is public information before anybody thinks I'm, I'm outing anybody, uh, but I, I really wanted to give everybody an example of fines specific to emergency equipment across the U.S. Uh, I'm just going to call out one, and that's the, uh, the elephant on the map up in the left-hand corner. Um, almost a $200,000 penalty. Um, this was in Coos Bay, Oregon uh, for an athletic club. The violation was pretty simple. Uh, employees were working with extreme pH chemicals, and they weren't provided with proper eye wash and shower station. Um, probably means they were just working with pool chemicals, uh, to be entirely honest with you. Um, to reach that kind of fine, it could have been a repeat violation um, uh, or, or something similar. But I just wanted to give you guys a good example of spread of uh, violations across the U.S. So what is the ANSI ISEA Z358.1-2014 standard? Um, it was written by the ISEA, that's the International Safety Equipment Association. Uh, it's used by ANSI uh, to define emergency eyewash, shower design, location, and temperature requirements for proper functionality and usage. And it's referenced by OSHA. Uh, OSHA has never officially adopted the standard um, as their own, um, but they use it during site inspections and violation reporting, and is the, uh, it's the recognized source of guidance to comply with their standard 1910.151C. Now, uh, ANSI uh, first published the standard in 1981. It's been revised several times since uh, in 1990, 98, 2004, 2009, and 2014. Um, probably reasonable to think that they would uh, um, add on or re-release the standard uh, by the end of this year, maybe next year. Uh, in 2009, uh, the revision included temperature range for water delivery, simultaneous use, and eyewash testing requirements, all huge changes in the standard um, and some really important ones that a lot of us are still adjusting to today. 2014, uh, the revision included design, manufacture, and installation of emergency equipment, installation location, and adjusted measurements, a lot of which uh, applied to manufacturers like ourselves of, of emergency equipment. Um, luckily, Haas was already ahead of the curve, uh, but in a lot of situations, uh, people are still um, adjusting this type of, uh, to this type of changes in their facility. Um, we're gonna get into poll question number one. Uh, Nicole, if you would uh, launch that for us, please. All right. All right, here we go. All right, which best describes your role in choosing showers and eye face washes? We'll give you just a few seconds to submit your answers. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to get your answers in. All right, thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, what are the significant requirements uh, and how to test for those requirements? 
So to begin with, uh, I need to bring up what I think is the most important and uh, oftentimes um, what we typically find is a non-compliant uh, issue inside facilities uh, is that weekly testing isn't being done. Weekly testing is requirement with, uh, a requirement with the ANSI standard. Um, it's very simple. I know it chews up employee time, but it, it really needs to be done. Uh, all that need, has to be done is that the equipment has to be activated. We have to ensure water flow to the heads of the device. And the duration of that activation has to be long enough to clear out the dead leg portion of the, of the piping. Uh, the, uh, back to the source of the water and make sure we're getting clean water in those pipes. We don't have any growth, buildup, uh, or decay in the piping. Annual testing is also a requirement. Um, annual testing is going to encompass everything I'm about to cover. It is a head-to-toe evaluation of your emergency equipment um, and only needs to be done once a year, but it is uh, a all-encompassingly uh, um, uh, a test. So, um, and I'll go over uh, each of those requirements and how to test for those uh, as we go along. Some of the tools that you're going to need. Uh, number one, tape measure. A lot of measurements for the annual test uh, and for the other measurements. Uh, an eyewash gauge, our model uh, 9015 if you need one. Uh, an eyewash gauge is going to help us with the flow rates uh, and the flow of uh, a pattern from the eyewash or the eye, uh, eye face wash. The five gallon bucket with a two gallon water line mark, and I'll explain why the two gallon uh, mark a little bit later. A shower sock and pole, that big yellow thing you see there on the right, to capture the water from the shower uh, so that we can measure it. A thermometer to check the temperature of the water and uh, a checklist, the Z358.1 checklist, which we will provide uh, post-webinar to you to make sure that uh, you are checking off everything that is necessary for the test. Okay, so let's get into, uh, let's get into the first requirement. Uh, the equipment needs to be accessible within 10 seconds um, or 55 feet. 55 feet was added to the addendum of the standard um, to give us a measurable distance from the hazard to the piece of emergency equipment. All of us move at a different pace. Uh, 10 seconds could be different for every single one of us. So they wanted to give us something tangible, something we could measure. Uh, to check for this, get a tape measure. Um, or a, a measuring wheel, measure the distance between the, uh, the equipment to make sure that it's well within um, uh, 10 seconds or 55 feet. The equipment needs to be located on the same level as the hazard. This means no steps, no changes in level. Um, we have to make sure that uh, the piece of emergency equipment is sitting on the same exact floor level as the hazard. Um, that's to make sure that we're not creating any uh, obstacle courses. Uh, we don't want to make it difficult for the victim to get to the piece of emergency equipment or create tripping hazards that could uh, injure them on their way to the equipment. Um, to confirm this, just walk the path between the hazard and the emergency equipment to make sure that you don't have stairs or a uh, different floor chain or a floor change. It needs to be free of obstructions. Obstructions can be a lot of different things. It could be a garbage can, it could be a hose, it could be piping in the way. Uh, it can be a lot of different things. Again, I would just recommend traveling the path from hazard to equipment, make sure there's nothing there. Emergency equipment is kind of uh, a weird beast. You, you want, we want you to purchase it. It's required that you have it. It's gonna go into the corner. We don't ever want you to have to use it. Uh, if you're using a piece of emergency equipment, you're having a really bad day, um, probably one of your worst. And uh, the issue with that is that there could be long periods of time, especially if you're not doing weekly testing, that it's sitting there um, without any attention. And you get issues like this on the right where you have uh, stuff that just builds up around it. Um, so make sure that you're, uh, you have a clear path to the equipment. It can be activated easily and it's free of obstructions. Now the area needs to be well lit and it needs to be easily identifiable with highly visible signage. Uh, now on the right here, you can see there's no signage available. Um, if you've had, uh, if you've been exposed to corrosive material uh, or something else that is damaging to your eyes, your skin, it's so important that that piece of emergency equipment is as easily identifiable as possible. But it's very highly likely that you don't have very good use of your eyes, you can't see very well, and you're navigating to this piece of emergency equipment on memory, even. Uh, hopefully, somebody's nearby to help you. Um, but make sure that you're checking for proper signage. It's highly visible. It's in a well-lit area. Um, 
even in, in this example, again, the signage is usually sun-worn, cracked, broken next to the unit. We need to make sure we replace that kind of signage. The equipment needs to deliver flushing fluid for a full 15 minutes. This one's so very important. Uh, on an annual basis, the 15 minute uh, test needs to be done. And that's to make sure that this equipment is capable of delivering first aid for that full 15 minutes. Um, even first responders uh, will oftentimes make you finish a full 15 minute flush before removing you to a first aid facility. Um, hopefully you've done it before they got there. And that's because uh, one, they don't wanna contaminate themselves and make the situation worse. Um, two, they need to make sure all of that contaminant, uh, chemical, whatever it is, is off of you entirely. So you're not continuing to be damaged by that, that chemical on the way to the hospital. So full 15 minute flush is very important. Check your SDS sheets in your facilities. Some chemicals uh, require a much longer flush than 15 minutes. So make sure you're referencing that. And then to test, just make sure you're running it for a full 15 minutes once a year. Outlets need to be protected from airborne contaminants. Uh, these are dust covers. Um, to test this, just make sure all the heads of the device, any stored flushing fluid uh, has a dust cover. No flushing fluid is exposed to dust and other contaminants that can build up in there. Um, just make sure you're checking everything's covered. Uh, the dust cover itself needs to be self-removing. That's only if it's on the head of a device. If it's on stored flushing fluid, it doesn't have to be self-removing. That's not a big deal. But like you see on the photo on the right, that yellow cap on the eye face wash has to remove itself when the equipment is activated. Um, and we have to have activation in one second. So that dust cover has to pop off um, by itself. You cannot use hands. Otherwise, that would be non-compliant. Now the equipment needs to go from off to on in one second or less and remain on without the use of the operator's hands, which is really important. Uh, your hands are gonna be, uh, you're gonna need them during an emergency. One, like uh, you see in the video below, removing clothing, activating the equipment, holding your eyes open so that you're getting a full flush of your eyes. Um, we've gotta make sure that uh, the equipment is turned on and stays on. <clears throat> These are stay open valves. Um, a very popular thing to do back in the day uh, with emergency equipment was to provide self-closing valves. So make sure you're inspecting your equipment for self-closing valves, spring-loaded valves, and that they stay open. They do not self-close. Um, and for the test, again, just evaluate the activation. Uh, make sure that water flows to the unit in one second or less. Um, and I'll show you how to do all that in the, uh, in the, the steps coming up here. Now, all emergency equipment has minimum flushing fluid requirements. An eye wash, like you see on the left, two streams of water only requires 0.4 gallons per minute. This is a minimum. So an eye wash has to meet a minimum of 0.4 GPM. An eye face wash has to meet a minimum of three gallons per minute. And a drench shower has a minimum of 20 gallons per minute. Uh, I converted to liters below those for my friends up north. Um, so to test those, um, number one, we must provide a controlled flow of flushing fluid at a velocity low enough to be non-injurious to the user. Injurious flows, I have an example coming up. Um, they can be painful. They can force you out of the equipment early. And we want to make sure that it is a comfortable flow of water for the victim. Uh, and you need to think about it several different things uh, when considering that. What they've been exposed to is a harmful flow of water going to do further damage to their skin than the corrosive material is already doing. Uh, so we need to be careful. We need to make sure that it is a gentle flow of water coming out of the unit. Now, the one of the ways that we test this is uh, something that was provided to us by the ANSI standard. So flushing fluid needs to cover the areas between the interior and exterior of a gauge at some point less than eight inches above the eyewash nozzle. Now, on the uh, bottom right-hand corner there, there's a, a um, sketch. This was given to us by the ANSI standard um, and how to design one of these gauges. You can see ours on the left there, again, model num uh, number 9015. This gauge is based on the average human eye spacing. So we start at eight inches and we slowly lower that gauge until it meets the eyewash streams to make sure that we're providing, th that it's usable by a, a person. Um, again, eye wash flow rate 0.4 GPM, eye face wash flow rate 3 GPM. Below, these photos are uh, very poor examples of providing either of those. 
And I wanted to show you what that looked like. So too much flow and injurious flow is the example on the left, obviously. Uh, nobody's going to want to put their face into this. Uh, I call these brain washers. It's going to hurt the soft tissue of your eyes so badly to put your face in this. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the times with this equipment in the field and uh, some of our competitors are not utilizing flow controls to help control this water. Um, and it creates an injurious situation for the victim who's already having a really bad day. On the right, we have too little flow. This can be even more dangerous. Um, you don't have enough water to supply uh, a functional usage for this eye wash, and now you're having to choose between the right eye or the left eye that you want to save. Uh, my eyes aren't spaced eight inches apart, so I can't use this eye wash. Um, hopefully, that, as you noticed in my photo at the beginning of the webinar, uh, this would be very difficult to use, and we don't want to force somebody into this type of situation. Now, the flow pattern, uh, the way we measure this, as you see in the video below, we are measuring to eight inches above the heads of the device, slowly lowering the gauge to make sure that the streams of the eyewash are meeting those two circles on the gauge. This will ensure that somebody can utilize the eyewash or the eye face wash um, and to make sure that they uh, receive proper first aid. Now the minimum flow rates, again, 0.4 and 3 GPM, this can be tested at the same time. Now, as you can see, again, he's measuring to eight inches. He lowered the gauge. You can even see the eye washes uh, meet up with the gauge in the video there. You can see them hitting the center of those circles, which means it's usable. But also, it's reasonable to think that if the water is meeting this minimum performance of the gauge, that it's also meeting the GPM requirements for usage. So if it's usable, it's reasonable to think that it's meeting those GPM requirements. And that's how we measure that. I'll also teach you how to uh, check for injurious flow, which we have a hard measurement for. Now, the flow pattern, it needs to be arranged so the flushing fluid is not less than 33 inches from the surface floor of the user and not greater than 53 inches from the surface floor of the user. This is how we're preventing in injurious flow. So as you can see on the right, uh, we have a 33 to 53 inch range measuring from the floor line, whatever this, the victim is standing on when they use the equipment, that's what we need to measure to. And we're measuring to the top of the flow pattern, not to the heads of the device. This was a mistake they made in the past. In the 2009 standard, it was a hard measurement, 45 inches max to the heads of the device, um, which did not help us to prevent injurious flow. So remember, we're measuring to the top of the water, not to the heads of the device. We also need to make sure that there's a minimum of six inches from the heads of the device, and that's to make sure that when we go to use this equipment, we are not uh, bumping our heads on anything, a wall, piping, anything that could be passing through that area uh, or built around that area. I wanna make sure somebody doesn't further injure themselves uh, when they go to use it, because again, they don't have very good use of their eyes, and we wanna make sure it's a clear, uh, easy area to use. Now again, the flow pattern, 33 to 53 inches. Grab a tape measure, measure from the surface floor, measure up to the top of the water stream to make sure we're good. With the minimum distance and the six inches, start from the head of the device. If it's a bullhorn, like you see on the right, measure from each eyepiece to make sure that it's clear from six inches, not from the center. Um, if you have a, a head like in the previous slide, a single head like our Haas Axion, make sure you're measuring from the center of that and measuring out to make sure it's clear six inches but use a tape measure for both measurements. Now the shower uh, needs to provide a minimum flow rate, again, 20 GPM. Now that's, that's a lot of water, but this is a minimum flow rate. And an injurious flow from a shower can be hard to gauge for a lot of people. Uh, what one person thinks is comfortable, comfortable, another person might not. But the minimum is 20 GPM. We try to stick that as closely as possible, especially with our Haas Axion technology to make sure we're providing a comfortable use for the victim and full body coverage at the same time instead of dumping 30, 40 gallons on top of them, uh, which can be a really uncomfortable experience considering you have to be in there for 15 minutes. Now a combination unit, um, and we're talking simultaneous use, a, a shower and an eye face wash or an eye wash working at the same time is a combination of the previous measurements. So a shower and an eye wash, 20.4 GPM, a shower and an eye face wash, 23 GPM, okay? So to test the flow rates for the shower head, 
uh, you're going to need that equipment that I mentioned before. Um, and we're going to repeat the process that you see here on the right. So you need the five gallon bucket with the two gallon water line marked. Um, you need the shower, sock and pole and the thermometer. What we're going to do first is uh, start by throwing that thermometer in the bottom of the bucket. Uh, place the shower sock around the shower head and into the bucket. I would also suggest not wearing your favorite shoes. Uh, activate the shower for six seconds. Okay, it's a lot like checking a pulse. They, they, uh, when you go to the hospital or if you give blood or whatever it is, um, they don't actually check your pulse for the for, for the full 60 seconds. They check your pulse for 10 seconds and then times that by six. We're doing the same exact thing here to make our 20 gallon water mark in our six seconds. We just times it by 10. So as long as we're meeting that two gallon water level in that five gallon bucket, we know that we're meeting 20 GPM. Okay, so make sure that it's meeting that water level and you will know that you are meeting 20 GPM uh, per minute. Now the shower flow pattern uh, is a really great way to make a mess. Um, I oftentimes suggest that putting that shower sock in place and if the equipment isn't cracked or broken, it's reasonable to think that if you're meeting that two gallon water line mark, you're getting your 20 GPM, that the equipment is functioning how it should beneath that shower sock. Um, but I, I also recommend going a step further. Like you see on the right, taking the shower sock off. If, if you're in an area that you, you're able to do this in, um, some areas have sensitive equipment, some don't have drains and things like that. And with that much water that quickly, it can make a pretty big mess. Um, but if you have the capability, take the shower sock off, activate it without it in place. You can see the left photo is a perfect example of a, uh, uh, correct flow pattern, which is 20 inches wide at 60 inches above the surface floor of the user. And that's again, that's based on average body metrics. We're making sure that shoulder to shoulder is being met by the water. Um, and, and the average height human will be completely enveloped in water when using that equipment. On the right side, you can see a, uh, a, a pretty bad situation. Uh, we don't have enough water to this equipment. Um, there could be a lot of issues here, uh, but we have a poor flow. It's not going to meet you shoulder to shoulder. It's not providing enough water to completely envelop your body, uh, your body, especially when using that uh, eye face wash, um, and isn't going to rinse you off uh, appropriately. We also need to make sure that we are making sure the column of water from the center of the column is clear 16 inches. Okay, so measure from the center of the column and measure out. It needs to be clear by 16 inches to make sure that that space isn't obstructed. Now the shower head water column, again, 20 inches wide, 60 inches above the floor. Um, as you can see my coworker here in the video below, he is measuring the width of the shower flow pattern at 60 inches above the floor to make sure that we have full body coverage. Now the shower head itself must be 82 to 96 inches uh, above the surface floor of the user. To test this, simply take a ta tape measure, measure from the surface floor up to the very bottom of the shower bell uh, or, or whatever is uh, the, the head of the dice, wh whatever the water is coming out of, that's what I measure to. Um, we need to make sure to that point that we have uh, that that falls between that 82 to 96 inches. If it's too low, we create a narrow flow pattern from the shower head. If it's too high, it's too um, wide and maybe isn't rinsing your body off the way it should. Um, just again, simply use the tape measure, measure from the floor to the shower head. On the pull rod, it's the same exact example. Uh, the pull rod cannot exceed a maximum height of 69 inches from the surface floor of the user. And that is because it's reasonable to think the taller amongst us can grab that pull rod at any height. Um, but the shorter, uh, we don't want to make it too hard for them to reach up and grab that pull rod. So we cannot exceed 69 inches from the floor. So use the tape measure, measure up to the very bottom of the pull rod, the, por the portion that they're going to grab, and make sure it's within that 69 inch range. Combination unit components shall be capable of operating simultaneously and shall be positioned so that the components may be used simultaneously by the same user. This is uh, non-compliant uh, more often than I'd like to admit. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people installing these components or equipment in your facilities maybe haven't uh, educated themselves on the ANSI standard. And oftentimes, the shower head is pointing one way, the eye face wash or eye wash is pointing the other way. 
um, and we need to make sure that they are used uh, simultaneously by the same person and that they work at the same exact time. So activate both the eyewash and the shower head together and ensure that we are meeting a 20.4 GPM and a 23 uh, GPM requirement. Um, and that no starvation occurs. Oftentimes water will take the path of least resistance, which is the shower head. It's pumping out the most water. It makes sense that the water would easily take that path to get out of the equipment, um, which will end up starving your eye wash or your eye face wash when it's turned on. Um, if flow controls aren't used. We use flow controls in all of our equipment to help prevent this, um, but that's not the case across the board uh, for all emergency equipment, unfortunately. So make sure you're getting activation at the same time. For instance, when you're doing the test for the shower GPM, make sure the eye wash or the eye face wash is on so that you can see any dip in performance in that when you turn the shower on. Uh, also, when you test this, make sure the shower head is di directly in front of uh, or lined up with the eye wash or the eye face wash. These are not intended for separate situations. Uh, now, if shutoff valves are installed in the supply line for maintenance purposes, uh, provisions have to be made to prevent unauthorized shutoff. Uh, this means lockout, tagout, a, uh, a valve in line, a locking valve in line, etc. Um, this one can take a little bit of time, um, but you only have to typically do it once or, or just train your maintenance team to do it this way, but trace the supply line as far back to the source as you possibly can to make sure that there are no shutoff valves that are easily accessible that employees could just turn off on a whim. We wanna make sure that when somebody turns on a piece of emergency equipment, it actually turns on and the water isn't shut down, uh, shut off down the line. Otherwise, somebody's gonna be hunting that down and every second counts when you've been exposed to a corrosive material. So make sure that these are locked out uh, for maintenance purposes only. The equipment needs to de deliver tepid flushing fluid. Um, our range is 60 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 16 degrees Celsius to 38 degrees Celsius. 75% uh, of ophthalmologists say that having tempered water is very important and citing that it increases the chances that a victim can tolerate the full 15 minute flush required. I've heard um, just the most awful stories of coworkers having to forcibly hold um, their coworkers into uh, emergency equipment because it's, it's too hot or it's way too cold. Um, but what they're dealing with, what they've been exposed to is so much worse than having to deal with hot or cold water. Um, but the, the issues with hot and cold water go far beyond what you've been exposed to. You can uh, be dealing with a, a much worse situation. I'll go over those a little bit later here in the, in the presentation but make sure our range is well within that uh, range. Our most comfortable degree that we could uh, pretty much agree on is about 85 degrees. Uh, it's still a little cold. Um, your home shower is in 85 degrees, but uh, that's a pretty comfortable range for somebody. So tepid water, to test this, um, use a thermometer uh, or, uh, in, the, in the flow of water, like you see in the video below. Um, place the thermometer in the five gallon bucket before activating the shower to get a really accurate read. Um, for eye washes, eye face washes, and things like that, just put, the, uh, put it into the streams of the device or into the bowl and let it run over the device to get an accurate reading. Employees who may be exposed to hazardous materials shall be instructed in the location and proper use of emergency showers. Uh, a really great way to test this is go to your employees on the floor, or if you are an employee on the floor, you can think about it right now, but quiz your employees on the location of the nearest piece of emergency equipment. Ask them, if you were exposed right now to a, a, a hazardous material, where is the closest first aid piece of equipment um, to, to your area here? And, and quiz them on and see what their answers are, and then uh, train them on how to reach that equipment, how to properly use it. Make sure you're checking for the need for freeze protection. So it says in the standard where the possibility of freezing conditions exist, the unit shall be protected from freezing or freeze protected equipment shall be installed. Uh, like you see on the right, this is our 8317 CTFP. It's a heat traced unit to prevent the pipes from freezing. The pipes freeze, we're not gonna get any water out of the unit and uh, somebody's gonna have a real bad day. So check local weather patterns for sub-freezing temperatures or any process uh, that may create a freezing environment inside of your facilities because those exist as well. Uh, in, uh, some installation considerations. These were in the appendix to the ANSI standard um, and provided uh, some leeway on a couple things. 
Um, this first one that was included was allowing for a single step into an enclosure where the emergency equipment can be uh, accessed is not considered to be an obstruction. We realized, or they realized pretty quickly, that providing a booth type of equipment, which is absolutely necessary in some situations, like you see on the right, this piece of equipment, this is a Haas integrated booth. Uh, it has a heater in the cabinet there. Um, it's freeze protected. Uh, it's providing tepid water through the cabinet in the back of the booth. This type of uh, equipment could go on a oil rig in Alaska. It could go in, in freezing temperatures and keep the victim inside from, uh, um, from suffering further from the temperature outside of the booth. Now, the reason this is so necessary is because of environments like that. And we realize we can't make this type of equipment flush with the ground. So we have to allow a step into this type of enclosure. So one single step is allowed as long as it's into a booth or enclosed type of equipment. Otherwise, you are not allowed to have any change in level, remember, from the beginning of the webinar. <clears throat> OK, so uh, a door does not constitute an obstruction if it meets the following requirements. So you can have a door in between the hazard and the emergency equipment, but it does have to meet certain requirements before you are allowed to have one. Uh, those requirements are is that it needs to be non-locking. Uh, we wouldn't we'd hate to have a situation where somebody tried to was dealing with a hazard, got exposed, and couldn't get through the doors or had to find a way to unlock it first. Because remember, every second counts. Uh, the doors have to open in the direction of the emergency equipment. Okay. The hazard also has to be non-corrosive. Um, if it's corrosive, automatically you have to have emergency equipment in that room, <clears throat> not outside of the room. They have to get to that as fast as possible. Um, they also have to be push bar or panic bar activated. So again, it goes with that uh, second requirement. The doors have to open in the direction of the uh, equipment, and you have to be able to push them open. Uh, OK, we are going to launch our, uh, our second poll question for the webinar. Uh, Nicole, if you would please uh, take care of that. OK, lots of good information here, Justin. Give me a second here, so I will get this shared. All right. All right. Poll question number two. What are you likely to do after today's webinar? Check all that apply. Please, if you... Um, if this answer does not apply to you or you don't plan to do anything, go ahead and just leave this blank. Okay, we'll give you just a second more. Get all your answers in. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you for doing those. I really appreciate it. Uh, only a couple more, um, but let's get into uh, ADA requirements uh, and how they affect emergency showers and eyewashes. Um, I really quickly want to touch on this. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Um, the the main mission of this webinar is ANSI and the standard and how to test. Um, but this is so important for certain facilities. Um, and ANSI has a lot to do with how ADA for emergency equipment is defined. Now, emergency equipment is defined as an element of a building, and it has to follow many of the same guidelines as drinking fountains, sinks, and other elements inside of a building. Now, if you have watched my, uh, my ADA webinar, uh, you know that elements can mean a lot of different things. Uh, now, if you're asking yourself if you need ADA equipment in your facility, uh, then you know to ask yourself whether or not you have granted access to that part of the facility. Um, to those who would require ADA accessible equipment. Uh, and if, if the answer is yes, then um, uh, you need to make sure that we're uh, supplying ADA type equipment in that building. If you have not granted access to that particular uh, part of your facility, then there's no need for ADA equipment. Um, so in the case of emergency equipment, there are some things you need to keep in mind during installation. Uh, I'm gonna start with a lab sink type equipment for an, uh, for an example. Um, now, remember that when considering ADA equipment, that the ADA standards were originally developed from ANSI requirements. Uh, so just some food for thought. Now, lab sink bowls, 
must not exceed seven inches in depth uh, so that we can maintain a 27 inch knee clearance for the wheelchair. Um, and the bowl basin should be at least 17 inches inside, measured front to back to allow the eyewash uh, to run into the sink. Um, we don't want those contaminants to run onto their legs. The ADA drinking fountain allows the bubbler to be three to six, in, uh, three to six inches from the front edge. And because your eyes are higher than your mouth, uh, the eyewash spray head uh, should be from five inches to eight inches from the front edge of the countertop. There are many uh, types of this equipment. Um, so we need to make sure that we are taking into consideration where the heads of the device will sit when activated and when deactivated to ensure ease of use and that it is reachable. Uh, I'll cover these re uh, reach ranges here uh, shortly. Now, laboratory countertops are typically deeper in reach than a common lavatory uh, counter. Uh, so you need to be careful to ensure that your maximum reach ranges above the finished floor are observed for uh, the depth of the countertops on your project um, uh, to make sure that they are, uh, again, reachable. Now, because ADA uh, Chapter 3 on accessibility uh, dimensions apply to all building elements, the emergency shower must also observe the minimum 30 by 48 inches, which is what you see here. It's a clear floor space defined in section 305.3. However, uh, the ISEA ANSI uh, standards, E358.1, requires the center of the shower column to be at least 16 inches wide from any obstructions, which actually ends up aligning with California requirements providing a 32 inch wide by 48 inch deep clear floor space to ensure maneuverability in and out of a space um, and would look similar to, uh, uh, to this diagram, but with a 32 inch wide minimum. Um, now, uh, there are some, um, uh, a good example of how to accomplish ADA um, that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll provide to you. But our reach ranges, uh, as I was describing, is section 308 under the ADA, 308.2.1 specifically for unobstructed and 0.2.2 for obstructed high reach. So, and it says where a forward reach is uh, unobstructed, like you see in the diagram on the bottom left, the high forward reach shall be 48 inches maximum from the floor. Uh, this measurement is important to us because that's typically where you'd be, um, you'd be your max reach range for uh, the activation of uh, a countertop or a lavatory type uh, piece of emergency equipment. Now, for obstructed high reach over an obstruction, which is probably going to be the case, um, you're going to have some, a countertop or something else there to a sink to catch the water. Um, so when it's over an obstruction, the high forward reach needs to uh, shall be 48 inches maximum, where the reach depth is 20 inches, uh, and 44 inches maximum, where the depth is 20 to 25 inches. So obviously, if we're reaching over something that is deeper to activate something, our reach range is uh, decreased, especially when you're confined to a wheelchair. Um, so here's a much better example of that, uh, that floor space. We have 48 inches deep, 32 inches wide. Um, to account for that 16 inches of clearance for the shower head. Um, so make sure you're measuring uh, the space. I would argue to provide as much space as possible for a wheelchair to access a piece of emergency equ equipment, especially since you're gonna have to deal with first responders and them having enough room to work as well. Uh, so make sure you're paying attention to that uh, fact inside of your facility. Um, here uh, are good examples of how to accomplish ADA compliance with a wall and ceiling mounted eye face wash and uh, shower using our models 8356 WCC and 8356 WCW. These are very common for an ADA application. These are flush mounted with the wall, uh, meaning they're unobstructed for the reach range. So you can see that the activation for the equipment, we've gone away from a pull rod. Um, again, very common that the activation be on the wall where ADA is required. So you can pull down the tray for the eye face wash and you can pull down the activator level on the uh, lever on the right for to activate the shower. Um, now this requires that the shower head to be located so that it is usable by the disabled uh, person uh, seated in the wheelchair. The dimensions in the standard uh, installation guide meet or exceed all those requirements uh, in the 2010 ADA. Now remember that the pull rod or activator for the shower cannot exceed 69 inches from the surface floor uh, of the user. So these um, uh, wall-mounted versions uh, fall well within compliance. So again, 
with this, same as uh, ANSI in a lot of situations. Um, this, for example, would be one of those wall-mounted units I just mentioned. You have 82 to 96 inches to the shower head. This is something you really need to pay attention to with this type of equipment, because uh, the shower head may have to drop into your hallway. Um, as if, if it's mounted with the ceiling, it could be way too high and create a flow pattern that's not gonna help anybody. Um, we have 47.5 inches to the, uh, the activation on the pull rod for the eye face wash and for the shower. Um, 34.5 inches max to the head of the device, uh, giving us plenty of knee clearance for the wheelchair underneath the tray. And then we have plenty of uh, clearance uh, deep as well, 18.7 inches for, uh, again, for knee clearance. So make sure you're paying attention to all of these if you have to provide ADA type equipment in your facility and, um, and also reach out to us if you have any questions on this. I'm gonna go over some recommended best practices now. Um, things that we have noticed uh, that we have learned over our years that we definitely wanna share with you. Uh, the first being that equipment should be located in areas, again, with adequate space for emergency responders to fulfill their response activities. They're going to have to work on you uh, after you're done with the equipment and then remove you to um, a safe place. So make sure they have plenty of room to do that. Uh, make sure you're training your employees on how to access and activate the equipment during an emergency. We suggest doing a, a quick bump test for like high risk activities. Uh, this slide, I like including this because it's kind of just a bragging point for me. This is actually ANSI Z535.1, um, and it's color coding for uh, the appropriate hazard. Uh, red being an emergency stop bar button on, on machinery. Yellow being uh, tripping, falling, and striking hazards. Orange are parts of machinery and equipment that may cut, crush, or otherwise injure. And green, the color of a certain safety equipment manufacturer is the location of safety equipment. Uh, so make sure we're color coding our areas appropriately and um, that we're sticking with a Z535.1 as closely as possible so that people can identify first aid equipment uh, as quickly as possible. Remember, and I'll say it a million times, every second, every second absolutely counts. Now the correct equipment for the hazard, make sure that when you're dealing with an eye wash, uh, such as our 7603 there in the bottom left, uh, this is for wood shavings, dust, airborne particulates, things that aren't going to be corrosive or damaging to your skin. If it gets in your eye, we need to flush it out, um, but it's not gonna corrode um, uh, your body. An eye face wash is for minor incidents affecting only the, eye, uh, the eyes and face or minor pH uh, substance issues. Uh, a drench shower is for B PPE decontamination. That's what it's really for. Um, it, in the, the likelihood that you're going to get sprayed with contaminants and there be zero chance that it enters your eyes is just a ridiculous thought or, or that it gets on your face. And you're not going to want to stick your eyes into a 20 GPM flow from a, a, from a shower. So a drench showers are really... At, at their core, decontamination showers. If you have personal protective equipment that you're wearing that needs to get rinsed off before you remove it, a drench shower would be the way to, do, way to go. A combination unit is perfect for any situation. This will cover your entire body, your face, your eyes, um, and is perfect for airborne particulates, corrosive, any chemical uh, that you could be exposed to. This is the type of equipment you'd wanna have in place. Now, again, our tepid water range is 60 degrees to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, water that is too hot or too cold uh, can drive an injured user out of the emergency equipment far too soon, um, especially if we're dealing with, again, uh, above what you're even comfortable at home in your home uh, shower, which is about 105 degrees. Um, so make sure that we are providing a tepid range that is comfortable for the victim. Uh, too cold. Uh, temperatures in the lower end of the tepid water range may cause cold shock, uh, possibly leading to cardiac arrest. Um, uh, the uh, user can end their flushing time before the recommended time is passed, and they may not remove their clothing, um, which is really vitally important to getting those contaminants off of you. Um, these measurements, the 60 degrees, the bottom line, was uh, actually originated from an old naval study where they dipped Navy SEALs in <laughs> sub tepid water and timed them to see how long it took for them to get hypothermia. Uh, 
Now, I don't know if you mentioned, if you noticed from my photo at the beginning of this webinar, uh, I'm not a Navy SEAL. Uh, those guys are tough as nails. I'm going to get hypothermia in uh, pretty quick. I'm not trained like they are. Uh, so hypothermia on top of what you're already dealing with is going to lead to an even worse situation um, and an even more difficult path to recovery if, if you're dealing with uh, cold water. Too hot. Again, your home temperature is about 100, or uh, home shower is about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 110, 15, 120. Uh, anything above 100 degrees Fahrenheit is going to damage the soft tissue of your eyes. But then as we get hotter, we're going to start damaging our skin too. Um, it's going to open up our pores. Uh, it's going to lead to a really bad situation. So make sure we're keeping it under, at a minimum, under 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, a lot of what we're dealing with now uh, across the U.S. is uh, Legionella is at the forefront. So Legionella bacteria grows and thrives between 95 and 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, very unfortunately, this range overlaps the current ANSI tepid water range, um, which I imagine will be changing in future revisions uh, to make sure that we're below that 95 degrees because um, Legionella can be uh, pretty dangerous on top of whatever it is that you're already dealing with. Now, while the ANSI standard does require a weekly flush to clear all piping sections that lead to emergency equipment and eye washes, um, avoiding temperatures that harbor bacteria is a valuable step in limiting potential exposure. And uh, Nicole, we are we're through our uh, um, our little extras there for you. Nicole, if you would launch poll question number three, please. All right. All right. Based on the information that's been provided to you today, the question is, would you be interested in a free site uh, survey of your existing emergency equipment for ANSI compliance? All right, thank you. Okay, here we go. Um, moving on, uh, a couple last things uh, that I wanted to mention um, before I get into that that ANSI uh, um, uh, site survey is one, uh, remove your contacts. Uh, don't rub your eyes. Contaminants can get trapped underneath them. Make sure you're disrobing completely, including socks and shoes. Uh, contaminants can run down your body, get stuck in your shoes and your socks and continue to damage you. Uh, you got to be in your birthday suit. It's going to be uncomfortable. You might want something on the right uh, with a, a shower curtain. Uh, we even include a uh, robe in ours for after you're done uh, with the emergency flush, but you need to get everything off your body and that means uh, um, getting down to your birthday suit. Uh, so provide privacy curtains. Uh, again, uh, modesty in front of your coworkers uh, would be nice in this situation. So having a privacy curtain would be ideal. Make sure you're doing that bump test before high risk tests. If you're doing something particularly dangerous, turn on the equipment real quick, make sure that it's gonna function uh, appropriately and then turn it back off uh, just real quick. I have water, now I can go do this incredibly dangerous thing that I was here to do. Uh, be cautious while assisting to not contaminate yourself. If it's a coworker, I understand that you're you're going to be freaking out too. You want to help them. You want to get them to safety. But if you touch them and start to guide them and they've been contaminated with something corrosive, you're just potentially damaging yourself and you're making the situation even worse. So make sure in these type of situations, uh, verbally guide them to the equipment if, if you can. Um, yell at them, scream at them, <laughs> follow my voice, whatever it is that you need to do to get them there, but try not to contaminate yourself at the same time. Okay, now this is uh, this is my baby here at the at, at Haas. Um, this is our emergency shower and eye wash survey program. Um, what this is, is a complimentary shower eye face wash survey at site. Um, we will not in just inspect Haas equipment on your site. We will inspect every single piece of equipment that is that you could possibly have installed um, designed for emergency first aid, uh, for a shower, eye wash, squeeze bottles, whatever it is. Um, our offerings include one full day of inspections, um, again, complimentary. Uh, an inspection report detailing our findings, an executive summary chart like the one you see here on the right, uh, and let me explain that real quick. So you have this blue section of the pie. This is non-compliant other. This would be like a missing sign. You have obstructions in place. You have that unfortunately small 12% uh, compliant chart right there. Uh, these are based on 
an independent evaluation of 1,000 plus emergency equipment units. I'm, I'm not uh, over exaggerating here when I say that huge Pac-Man size portion of that pie is uh, performance related issues. Um, this means that the you went to the emergency equipment and the eye, eye wash, eye face wash, or shower did not perform or deliver first aid uh, relief. Um, and this is a really unfortunate number. It's what we find pretty typically. Uh, so please, uh, I would suggest taking advantage of, uh, of us if you can. Um, you'll also get uh, recommendations on how to fix all those issues. We're not going to leave you in the wind. Uh, we'll make suggestions on how to fix all of these issues. We'll provide a debriefing meeting or web conference with you to explain all of our findings uh, uh, in more in depth. Um, some restrictions do apply. I have people all across Canada and the US trained by yours truly uh, that can visit your facilities. So uh, please make sure to reach out to us if you'd like to uh, a free site survey. Well, we'd be happy to help you. OK, uh, Nicole, if you would launch poll question number four, please. All right. Again, based on the information provided to you in today's webinar, would you be interested in learning more about tepid water solutions? Give it just a couple more seconds here. All right, thank you. Okay, last and uh, before we start getting to the Q&A, uh, I also wanna bring up our Haas services. Um, they are a warranty and service provider uh, for all brands. Um, any emergency shower or eye face, uh, eye face wash equipment uh, booths that you have on site, um, they will ensure your uh, emergency equipment is ANSI compliant and functioning properly. Uh, they specialize in startup commissioning. Uh, they will do annual ANSI inspections for you, uh, which again can be difficult for your own maintenance staff to accomplish sometimes. Uh, either they're one, too busy because these, these tests do take a long time or it could be too difficult. They're, they're in areas where um, we need special expertise on how to conduct those tests. Uh, they offer an online competent inspector training and certification program. Uh, very inexpensive considering all the information that you get uh, when doing that, I've taken it myself. Uh, repairs and upgrades uh, they'll do on all of your equipment. Again, not just Haas. They'll make sure that you get the appropriate uh, equipment upgrades and repairs for all emergency equipment on site. They will do warranty service and uh, they also specialize in preventative maintenance and uh, contracts with your facility to make sure that they are your service provider, that they will come on site and assist you um, when it is that you need it most. So a uh, very important service of ours, and uh, please reach out to us if, if you're interested. Uh, and last, we're on to poll question number five. This is the last one, I promise, and then I'm gonna get, dig into uh, our Q&A session. So, uh, Nicole, if you would. All right. Again, we appreciate you guys attending, and this last uh, poll question is just based on the content that we've provided today. How helpful was the information provided in today's webinar? And we'll just give you another second or so. All right, thank you all for your feedback. All right, here we go. So questions and answer. Uh, you can still post questions um, uh, until we end the webinar. So feel free to th throw those in there if you have any questions that you've been saving. Um, again, not all questions will be answered at this time. I'll do my best. I'm gonna dig into some, uh, we put some of the most common ones together up here so we can uh, uh, throw those at you and get those answered. And then I'll start digging into uh, some of the ones that Nicole has been logging. So here we go. Uh, does ANSI apply in Canada? Uh, yeah, kinda. <laughs> uh, ANSI is kind of confusing up in Canada. Uh, some provinces uh, um, focus on the ANSI standard and include it in their own. Um, uh, some territories ignore ANSI entirely. Uh, British Columbia even developed their own standard for compliance. Uh, so it's 
kind of a mixed bag up in Canada. Again, ANSI isn't, uh, the C358.1 standard in particular isn't required anywhere, um, but it is the suggested source for compliance on, on how to meet, uh, say, OSHA or the CCOHS if you're in Canada on and how to comply. If you follow ANSI, there is a very minimal possibility that you are going to be non-compliant in the event of a, an audit. Uh, what is required in the weekly test versus the annual test? Remember, weekly testing is only activate the equipment, make sure you have water to the heads of the device, and that you're clearing out the dead leg in the piping. That's it. Super simple. The annual test is, gosh, everything I just went over. It's a pretty in-depth test. Measure the shower head, measure the flow uh, rates, measure the flow height, uh, run it for 15 minutes. Everything has to be included. Again, we're sending you a checklist post webinar in the email. So you can use that for your annual tests. Uh, copy that information, use it, do what you will with it. Uh, it's a really helpful document. Uh, with the ANSI update, are existing eye face washes, showers, and drench hose stations also required to meet the current guidelines? Okay, so uh, the standard itself has never included a what's called a grandfather clause. Uh, grandfather clause is typically a clause that's included in documents to help say, hey, uh, we put this together, um, but you don't have to meet any of these requirements if you had uh, equipment that was installed before we release this. There's no such thing in the ANSI standard. Um, we have to comply with whatever the most current version is, and that's 2014. So yes, all of your equipment has to meet these same guidelines uh, for the most current revision. Uh, does a door constitute an obstruction? Remember, as long as it's non-locking, it's push bar activated, the hazard is non-corrosive, um, and uh, it, it opens in the direction of the emergency equipment, a door is allowed. Um, it is not always an obstruction, but as soon as it's corrosive or meets any of those other uh, guidelines um, or violates any of those other guidelines, it is considered an obstruction. Uh, last, our requirements for drains included in the standard. There is nothing in the ANSI standard uh, that includes drains. Um, you would have to reference your local plumbing codes uh, for drainage requirements. This might change in the future since they're so important to emergency equipment. We're talking about 340 plus gallons over 15 minutes that's going to be dumped in your facility um, with potential uh, hazards in it, uh, chemicals and things like that. So drainage is really important to consider, um, especially for testing. Uh, okay, here we go. So uh, now on to the, the, the live Q&A. My information is on the screen if you want to... Uh, um, reach out and contact us, but we're going to take just a couple questions um, from Nicole uh, to uh, fill the rest of the webinar. Nicole? Volume of questions submitted. They're all great questions. We will not get to all of these today. However, in the follow up email, please keep an eye out for it, especially if you did ask a question, because we will be provided, um, we will be providing all of the questions with answers. Um, and if you have something specific, uh, we can discuss this offline as well. So um, let's see. I have a really a long one here that we can go ahead and touch on. Injury, injurious corrosive is an appropriate way to determine whether something is considered injurious corrosive to the skin by looking at the MSDS sheet for the product and looking at the hazard cap. then it would be injurious corrosive to the skin and would require the shower. If it doesn't have that hazard category, even the MS, um, that's more of a comment, my apologies. <laughs> no, that's okay. Actually, what you want to do, especially when you're when you're dealing with uh, um, those types of hazards, reference your SDS sheet first. Um, but uh, the first section that you're going to want to look to is uh, first aid response. So every SDS sheet is going to have uh, uh, first aid requirements for that chemical. Um, so it's going to say you need to rinse your eyes for this amount of time. You need to rinse your skin for this amount of time. You need to use soap, whatever that happens to be. It's going to say in the first aid response section of your SDS sheets. So make sure that you are referencing those first 
um, for how to respond to a first aid emergency with that chemical. Yes, uh, actually in the ANSI standard, uh, when it comes to schools, um, there are a couple special situations, um, but at any point, if you have a damaging um, chemical or substance in that, in that facility, lab, pulp and paper, water treatment, hospital, wherever it is, uh, some are biohazards, uh, you have to have emergency equipment. So if you have a substance in that area, your SDS sheet says for first aid response, you have to have this equipment or you have to have these capabilities, then you have to meet that. Great. If a product would damage your eyes, but is not corrosive, then my understanding is that the eye wash wouldn't be required per OSHA ANSI as the only, uh, as they only discuss injurious corrosive. Please confirm. Uh, yeah, so if a uh, if a product is only damaging to the eyes, say it's just a high pH uh, chemical that's not going to corrode your skin or do damage to your skin, an eye wash would be required. Um, if it's, uh, again, we would only really use a drench shower in situations where we would have PPE decontamination type stuff or, or things that are um, not going to be corrosive that you may want to get off of your body. Uh, but again, um, if you're dealing with a corrosive type hazard, eye face wash, shower, you want the works um, because the likelihood that something's going to spray, say for instance, a battery or battery acid, uh, is gonna cover your, it's unpredictable where it is that you're gonna get exposed, even with PPE in place. Um, but in your instance, if, if you have a situation where it's non-damaging, you can uh, limit it to an eye wash or uh, just a shower, again, for decontamination of uh, PPE. Great. And I'll, I'll say this will be the last one, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. And again, like I said before, we'll be sending these out um, in the follow-up email. Last question. When do you recommend a tempered water system for a building with one mixing valve and a pump for the system versus a mixing valve at each piece of the equipment? Um, so when it comes to emergency equipment, uh, there are particular mixing valves that are designed for their use. Um, a lot of mixing valves can't handle the GPM requirements of a, a shower and an eye face wash. 23 GPM per minute is a lot of a lot to keep up with. And if you're limiting that type of equipment, say you have multiple pieces of emergency equipment in your facility, um, and they're all sharing one supply uh, or one source of hot and cold water, if there are multiple emergencies or multiple need to be activated at the same time, uh, you're going to have uh, a, a really bad day. One a piece of equipment is going to steal from the other or both will be activated and neither will perform correctly. Um, there's all sorts of technology to keep up with this nowadays. We have instantaneous heaters designed for production equipment. Uh, our model 9326 or 9321 um, that's generally kept in the area with a mixing valve that's to supply that piece of equipment. Um, and in some instances, especially uh, when it comes to eye washes or eye face washes, uh, multiple pieces of equipment at the same time. But we want to make sure that we're taking starvation of this, the equipment into consideration. Um, what the te the internal temperature of your building is, uh, how long tepid water is going to last in your walls, and not limiting the water uh, in the event of multiple pieces of equipment needing to be used at the same time. Um, so uh, that would be my answer to that. So th thank you for all the questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for attending. We had a really overwhelming uh, uh, attendance rate, and we really greatly appreciate it. It's, um, we're highly appreciative that all of you took the time to attend today. So uh, in closing, I would like to say, please use my information on the screen. We'll be uh, sending out that follow-up email with the recorded webinar, the checklist, and other resources for you. Um, the All of the questions completely answered by uh, myself, uh, your Shrula, I'll go through everything and make sure those are answered and sent back to you so that nobody's left hanging. Uh, so please look forward to that email. And uh, again, thank you for attending our webinar. Uh, we greatly appreciate it and have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.